Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ita Berner from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And I'm going to talk to you today about the book that I have just edited, and it's coming out in November. Um, some of the people who are at the conference were active contributors to it, which I appreciate. And the book is entitled Informatics Education and Healthcare Lessons Learned. That's, uh, I don't have the book in hand yet. It's supposed to come out uh, probably right after this conference, but that is, that is the book and um, it's available from Springer. Uh, and by the way, I don't get any royalties from it. I have been, uh, I, if you buy it, I get nothing. So uh, uh, what I'm gonna do is talk to you a little bit about how the book is organized and then describe the content of the book in the different sections, and then talk about some common themes across all of the, all of the different chapters. We've divided, in addition to an introduction and the summary of common themes, we've divided the book into five sections, training informatics specialists in the US, informatics education for other health professionals, that is uh, others, it could be physicians, nurses, et cetera, uh, who need informatics education but are not specifically informatics specialists, informatics education worldwide, and in this particular edition, we have expanded that section considerably. Uh, assessment of individuals and programs in informatics, and since distance learning is becoming more and more common, use of distance learning for informatics education. And actually, if you look at the order of the chapters, they really describe the evolution of the field from initial training to broadening the training outside informatics specialists to others, to broadening it from some of the places where many of it started in the US and in Europe to other places. And finally, getting to assessment of individuals with certification and accreditation programs as well. So uh, let's begin and I will just briefly go over the uh, content of these sections and then discuss some of the common themes. So the first section on training informatics specialists in the US. We have a chapter on informatics researchers that is primarily written, it's written from, by Valerie Florence from the National Library of Medicine and she describes some of the National Library of Medicine training programs, which were really one of the first uh, examples of training informatics uh, in the US. We have a chapter on nursing informatics that covers uh, nursing informaticians as well. This one also covers nurses who are in practice and what informatics they need. We have a chapter on health IT managers, those people who are going to be managing the information systems in, in the operational setting. We have a new chapter in this edition on translational bioinformaticians. This is, it's not pure bioinformatics, it's bioinformatics, translational bioinformatics specialists who are trained within a medical informatics training programs. And finally, we're seeing in the US at least, a number of programs for undergraduate informatics majors. And some of these are described both in the US and elsewhere. In the section on informatics education for other professionals, we've got a chapter for informatics for physicians, for health administration students who will become health administrators, for clinical and translational researchers, and now as informatics, has be, informatics and data science has become more and more important, NIH has a number of programs intramurally for their scientists there. Uh, and the nurses were described actually in the, in the previous chapter that I mentioned. If we look at informatics education worldwide, I don't know that we have the whole world in here, but uh, we have a number of, of major regions. We start with sharing the US curricula with other countries. Many of the, there are a number of efforts that have been done taking things, taking materials and programs and curricula originally developed in the US and bringing them to other countries. We have a new chapter on nursing informatics that's covering Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. And we have expanded chapters from the previous edition on the Asia Pacific region, Africa, and your own Latin America. And I want to stop for a minute and uh, give a shout out 
to the authors of this. You can see the list of authors, and the and I would assume that some of them at least are at the at the conference. And the countries covered in the Latin America chapter are Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay. When we move on to assessment, we're talking about both certification and accreditation. So the chapter on certification in clinical informatics uh, covers the physician subspecialty certification, which began, I believe, in about 2013, I think was the first exam. Uh, and it's for physicians who are board certified in their specialty and then take a subspecialty certification in informatics. Those, those physicians uh, can come from any subspecialty, but the board exam itself is run by the American Board of Preventive Medicine and the American Board of Pathology. Um, in that chapter, we also describe some of the fellowship programs in clinical informatics, as well as the new Health Informatics Certification Commission. Uh, the Health Informatics Certification Commission was started by the American Medical Informatics Association uh, just about a year ago. Uh, I am fortunate enough to be one of the commissioners on it. And the aim is to develop a certification exam, nationwide certification exam, that would uh, be appropriate for people who are not eligible to take the physician subspecialty exam. So that could be physicians who are not board certified, who have not maintained their board certification. They may, their uh, primary specialty certification. It could be for other health professionals or it could be for non-health professionals, um, non-clinician non health professionals. So the, that certification exam is in, in process of being developed uh, and within probably, we're hoping within another year or so, it will be available for uh, people to, to take. So we're in the process of developing it now. In any case, that chapter on certification discusses the background to the certification process as well as the, uh, as well as the new exam that's being developed. The, the chapter on accreditation of informatics programs is focusing largely on the growing uh, number of programs that are certified by KHIM which is the uh, commission, uh, commission on Accreditation on, for Health Informatics and Information Management Education. Uh, so there have been a number of um, programs that are certified and more are getting certified, I'm sorry, accredited, not certified. Uh, and um, the, process, the accreditation process for that is described in this chapter. And finally, um, we end, the, the last section is on the use of distance learning. Almost all of the other chapters uh, have addressed uh, distance learning in one form or another. But we pulled out, a, rather than letting it just sit in separate sections, we pulled out uh, one section specifically focusing on programs that are done uh, in, a, in an online format. So the AMIA 10 by 10 program uh, is one of them. And I think some of you may have even participated in it when it was brought to Latin America. Uh, the, uh, that's described and managing student and instructor assumptions. That's a very important part of uh, the transition to distance learning because the things that work in in-person education don't always work when you're working online. Um, in fact, probably for this conference, which is all online, we'll find out a number of things that don't always work the way they should. But um, it's very important to manage student and instructor assumptions with online education. And we have a chapter on that. And uh, we have a new chapter on challenge, the challenges in using free online informatics education materials. There are a number of sources of such materials, and we'll describe them a little bit later. But the, um, there are a number of challenges. So that chapter describes both some of the available materials as well as the challenges. So, if, and each of the almost, most of the chapters all end with specific lessons learned from uh, 
key points and lessons learned from in each of those areas. But what we did in the last, what I did in the last chapter was to look at some of the common themes and lessons across all of the other chapters. Uh, and I've divided that discussion. We're going to spend a little time now discussing that, um, some of these common themes. These themes are in the areas of the evolution of informatics programs, how the informatics programs relate to workforce needs and opportunities, competencies, sources of educational materials, as well as online instructional strategies, and ending with the evaluation and accreditation of um, the programs. So let's, let's look at these. What we found is that there's a different trajectory for the evolution in different countries. John Mantis has described the evolution in Europe as beginning with visionaries who developed individual programs and eventually there was an evolving consensus on curriculum and that led to, uh, as you had more programs, there was a greater need to evaluate them. In the United States, it was a little bit different, although I think there were some visionaries involved in our programs as well. In the US, the federal government supported training with an anticipation of future workforce needs. So the National Library of Medicine was one of the earliest sources of funding for uh, informatics training programs. And they began with training grants for really developing research informaticians. They felt the need for research scientists in informatics. And so the training grants were really, really developing faculty, even though not everybody who was trained in the NLM training programs went on to be a faculty member. The aim was really to produce researchers. On the other hand, another federal program in the US was the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Uh, while the National Library of Medicine programs began in the early 80s, the uh, ON, Office of National Coordinator programs began actually in, the, uh, in 2010. And there were a number of programs that they had, but again, they were anticipating operational, uh, operational health IT uh, training. So that's with the federal government beginning the programs um, specifically for training informatics specialists. After, after that, those programs took off, there's been much more incorporating informatics into the training of other health professionals. So nurses, physicians, and others are now having more required informatics uh, training into their, into their programs. As these programs grew, there was more and more a need for the certification of the skills of the individuals as well as the accreditation of the programs themselves. So at first you had a number of different grant supported programs, then more stable programs, and finally as there were more of these, the need was to, to really certify who is qualified and who isn't and what programs are appropriate and what aren't. So the, the focus now is much more on certification of individuals and the accreditation of the programs. In the low resource countries, uh, there, was, there was a somewhat different trajectory. There was more of a need for a telemedicine workforce um, and the telemedicine infrastructure could often be used for education. Uh, so many of these countries, and, and these are some of them in Latin America uh, that are described in that chapter, uh, partnered with the more developed countries, but there was always a need for local adaptation of the materials. Um, and it was not just translating from English to Spanish or English to another language. It was really adapting the programs for the, the specific needs and culture of the countries. Eventually, um, there was more independence with locally and regionally developed programs that were maintained uh, that did not require the partnership anymore. I think the partnerships stayed, many of the partnerships stayed, but many of them became much more independent. So the, the evolution across these, these different um, areas was, was different in different countries. 
if we look if we look at the educational programs and and what how does the programs relate to the workforce needs and opportunities um, as as we said one of the the reasons in the US for developing some of the programs was a, there was a clear need that was seen as an impetus to program development um, and some of those needs could be job opportunities that require informatics training. In fact, that was actually more like the, the telemedicine workforce that was needed. Um, and these may be official positions in healthcare organizations or official job classifications. But what we found, in, and as you read the book, it, you'll see some of the different descriptions. Even within the same region, only some countries have these official positions. These positions could be like chief medical informatics officer, uh, some, some other ones similar to that. Even within the same country, healthcare organizations vary. In the US, there are a number of places that have a chief research informatics uh, officer and others have nobody with that kind of title. And what many programs have found is that without these recognized positions, it's very difficult to get students. So you may have the visionary who developed the program. You may see a real need for the expertise but if you don't have an official position that, rec that requires that training, students are not necessarily going to be attracted to it. And in some ways, the role of certification is similar. As I said, we're moving towards both certification and accreditation of programs. Um, but if the certification does not provide added benefits, there's less motivation for people to, to take that step. Um, in terms of the competencies that are needed in informatics, um, many of the chapters address these competencies. And what you see across the different chapters is that there are many similarities, but also differences across the professional definitions of competencies. Some of those reflect differences in the roles of graduates, so that people who are in operational roles maybe need different competencies than those who are going into research. There are also certainly different disciplines that a physician uh, may need different, different competencies than a non-physician. Um, and some of the differences are because some of them are primarily going to be informatics specialists and others are bringing informatics into another discipline. Uh, the AMIA, the American Medical Informatics Association, has developed found what they've called foundational domains, which actually are used by, the, um, by KHIM to accredit the programs for the curriculum. And they actually provide a very adaptable template that can be used for a variety of, uh, of competencies. And I want to just share that with you. You, you can see kind of an overlapping Venn diagram there with, with uh, the F1, F2, and F3 domains of health, information science and technology, and social and behavioral science being the primary foundations. And then if you look at those intersections, health information science and technology, human factors and socio-technical systems, and social and behavioral aspects of health, um, those are intersections of any two of those original circles. And then finally in the middle is the integration of all of them. Acro around the edge you see, you see competencies that transcend any particular domain of uh, professionalism, collaborative practice, and leadership. If you think of these, this as a template, within each of those areas you can design very specific competencies for the particular area that you're interested, the particular role, particular discipline. And they, these were designed to be adaptable to a variety of disciplines. Um, if we move on to the sources of curriculum materials, um, there are some examples of sources here. Uh, and if you, if you get these slides, which you're welcome to, uh, you, can, you can see the links. The, uh, Curriculum from the Office of the National Coordinator, or the ONC curriculum, has 25 modules that include PowerPoints, uh, 
transcripts, voiceover narration, lectures, um, audio, audio, um, audio files for podcasts, etc. Um, there's some other materials available for the health informatics building blocks. And in terms of data science, uh, the OHSU Big Data to Knowledge um, educational materials are available as well. So these are sources of free online materials that can be used to develop uh, more specific curricula. And these are described again in the book, um, as well as the challenges of using these open materials. The biggest challenge being that they were developed at a certain point of time and they may not be kept updated. But if you who are using them are able to keep them updated, then um, they are a very rich source of, of basically building blocks for curricula. Um, and finally, more on the online instructional programs and strategies. So many of the programs are fully or partially online. And there's various motivations for choosing an online program. Um, we, uh, our particular master's program, and it's described in chapter four of the book, went from uh, in-person to online, um, mainly because we wanted to increase the student body beyond the local environment. But we found that students were asking for it because they wanted to stay in employed and still go to school. Um, it's probably very feasible for students when they're spread all over the country. And it may be less expensive than in person. But you do need to change pedagogy for online instruction. It's not exactly the same. And student and faculty assumptions must be managed. If, and finally, ending with the program evaluation and accreditation, because again, uh, all of this arises out of the development of the programs, the development of competent, agreement on competencies, et cetera. As a program profession grows and matures, um, accreditation of training programs is really the next step after you develop, uh, after the programs have been around for a while. And there are a number of motivations for programs to get accredited. Certainly pride and external approval. Uh, many programs look for accreditation because they feel it will attract more students. And in some cases, the workplace requires it. Right now in the US, and I don't think anywhere else either, there, there is, um, the workplace is generally not requiring accredited programs for informatics. They certainly do for medicine, they certainly do for nursing. Most of the other fields require it, but as informatics is still a very young field, the, that, that push for accreditation from the workplace has not, has not yet been there. But I think that that's one of the things we can expect is that as informatics grows, the growth of accredited programs will also grow. So in summary, describing the book, it's a description. Um, we've got a description of workforce needs, competencies, and informatics educational programs in the US and multiple regions outside the US that are for informaticians as well as for other health professionals. We've got a description of the certification and program accreditation activities an analysis of the evolution of the profession and the training required, as well as an analysis of common themes and lessons learned. And what I wanted to end with is showing you the large number of contributors, contributors who I truly appreciate for making this book what it is. I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly and just scroll down. And gracias. Thank you. Bueno, um, thank you very much, Edda, for the presentation. Uh, I will now uh, ask if anyone has any questions, and I will translate them. Um, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta que le quiera hacer a, a Edda, la puede hacer acá por el por el chat, y nosotros la vamos traduciendo. Um, so first of all. What was the main challenge you found with online education? Uh, when, our, when our particular program, you're talking specifically about the program that I'm involved with. 
Um, I think I think the man the, the reason that we have a chapter in the book on the managing expectations is because I think that there are some very subtle expectations that can prove challenging. Um, to give you some examples of them, uh, students are being used to to working in an online environment expect instant answers for anything. You know, you get an email and you answer instantly. And um, that can be very stressful for faculty, especially if they choose to respond instantly each time a student writes to them. What it means is they can be on call 24 hours a day, which really is not the case when you're teaching face-to-face. -face. So um, having students understand that there are limits and having faculty manage that whole process is a challenge. Um, there are also some things that are difficult to do online, although surprisingly, I think that there can be a lot of um, activities that can go on online and people don't, don't realize that. Um, in our particular program, um, every year we've had a site visit at our hospital so the students can see some of the systems in practice. So this year, obviously with the pandemic, I'm going to be challenged to figure out an alternative to that, and I'm still working on it. Um, but our current thinking is actually uh, doing a Zoom session with some of the places that we visit, uh, probably not maybe fully filming it, but having discussions with the people who usually give us the tour. But we're still working on that. So obviously, there are some things that can't be done online, so that can, that can be a challenge. But I think that um, I think that the um, I guess in terms of students, um, I think one of the things that students don't realize, and faculty may not either, is that a lot of the the what they find valuable in in-person instruction is the opportunity to informally interact with each other and with their instructor. And it's informal. It's not. It's not a. Uh, um, you know, it's not, it's not office hours. It's not making an appointment. It could be coming up to the class after, to the, to the front, to the teacher after class is over and asking a couple of questions or walking back to her office after class. Those kind of things you just cannot do online. And students may feel dissatisfied with online education and faculty too, because that's missing. And they don't realize that that's what the issue is. Because I truly believe that in terms of content and in terms of education, uh, learning material, that online is as good or better than in person. But a lot of the informal interaction just can't be done unless, unless you, you know, make yourself fully available to students 24 hours a day. <laughs> and that most faculty don't want to do. I don't know if that answered. Yeah, that thank you very much. Um, so I will translate it. Eh, se le preguntó cuál fue el principal desafío que se encontró en la educación en línea y ella comentó que bueno justamente tiene un capítulo de lo que es manejar las expectativas en el libro eh, porque a veces hasta no, no son muy sutiles, los, los estudiantes esperan respuestas inmediatas y que el profesor esté 24 horas al día y eso es muy difícil de lograr eh, y aunque llama la atención la cantidad de cosas que sí se pueden hacer online Hay, no todo se puede hacer. Por ejemplo, eh, ellos hoy, eh, todos los años permiten que los estudiantes vayan en persona, digamos, a, a ver la institución y los sistemas, y este año todavía está pensando a ver cómo, cómo puede hacer para, digamos, para reemplazar esto. Y por otro lado, quizás algo que ni, ni los estudiantes ni los profesores se dan cuenta de que es algo que les afecta la satisfacción, eh, es que uno de los principales asuntos que, que no se pueden resolver de vía online es la interacción informal, es acercarse al profesor, hacerle preguntas, eh, ir al despacho y, y digamos, eh, eh, indagar algunas cosas que quizás en el, en el marco eh, virtual eso es, está un poco más eh, dificultado. So, uh, there's another question here. Uh, do you consider that with this scenario of the um, COVID-19, there, uh, there are more students that are likely to uh, take online courses or online um, programs? Um, I haven't done a formal survey. I can tell you we've had many, many more applicants and very good applicants um, this year. We were very surprised, actually, 
because we we were we were concerned that we wouldn't get as many good students um, because of the the pandemic, and we actually got more. So I think I think you may be right. Many of them who are um, first of all they're home more now, so that they have they may have some of them who are working from home have more of an opportunity. Some of them may have had job shifts because of it and have had. Uh, employment issues that they're looking that they're looking to change, but we we did wind up with more and and better students in the, than in the past. Okay, thank you. Eh, bueno, entonces lo que le preguntamos es esto de si se considera que desde la pandemia aumentó el número de, de estudiantes por la posibilidad de cursar en línea. Lo que nos comentaba es que él no hizo una encuesta formal, pero que ellos tuvieron muchos y muy buenos estudiantes, que era una duda que tenían. Eh, y, y bueno, como tuvieron más que antes, probablemente sea cierto esto, eh, además de que aumentan las posibilidades de personas que quizás eh, están desde la casa y que no, no hubiesen podido mudarse, o los que tienen algunos asuntos laborales de los que ocuparse, que quizás pueden redistribuirse. So, um, one last question before we change to the next, um, to the next lecture. Uh, in the current context, and given the new horizons uh, with health informatics, how do you think that the uh, educational proposals will be redefined uh, related to the discipline uh, in terms of new contents or professional profiles? Uh, can you clarify what you mean by the, you mean in terms of professional profile, um, meaning like the kinds of, of jobs that, uh, kinds of, of competencies and work that that informatics people are going to have to do, is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, the, I mean, data science is currently a very big topic, data science and a variety of kinds of analytics. Um, but I think the problem, to me, I think one of the changes that we're gonna see is more use of genomic data in practice. There, there will be more use of it, and the informatics professionals in the healthcare environment are going to have to figure out how to handle it, uh, both handle it in terms of, of uh, getting the data into the electronic health record, making it available to practitioners, uh, developing decision support around that area, because many practitioners are not as familiar with the use of genomic data. Uh, but I think, that, to me, I think that's a, a really a big area that we will be moving into. Ok, thank you very much. Um, bueno, lo que comentó es que la ciencia de datos le parece que actualmente es un, un tópico enorme que puede ya ser eh, que uno de los cambios de mayor uso en la práctica va a ser el, el, la introducción de la genómica y que los profesionales de informática van a tener que empezar a ver cómo manejar esto en términos de... Eh, hacer que esos datos estén dentro de la historia clínica, que estén disponibles para los profesionales de la salud y desarrollar sistemas de soporte a la, a la toma de decisiones. Eh, un poco cree que ese es el área que más avanzará y que también más, eh, digamos, eh, estará relacionado con, con este tópico. Eh, si les parece, eh, Maru, ¿querés que continuemos con la siguiente charla en honor al, al tiempo? Ok, well, uh, thank you very much, Ere. It was a very interesting presentation.